Have you noticed how important an introduction or a beginning is? Whatever we do in life, whether it's making new friendships or relationships, whether it's reading a book or watching a new film, whether it's learning something new like playing a musical instrument or getting to grips with a new gadget like a fancy new computer, the beginning or the introduction that we have to the person or the thing we are doing is so important. Get it right and our interest remains and our desire to learn more grows. Get it wrong and we quickly decide that it's not for us. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean. My father-in-law loves all the latest gadgets that help around the home and particularly he enjoys his cooking. Recently, he started to tell me about a fancy new gadget that he's got called a George Foreman grill, which he demonstrated to me one Saturday morning by cooking me a bacon sandwich. He said it was so much easier to use than a normal oven grill and makes so much less mess. And because I was so bowled over by his enthusiasm, along with the fact that I absolutely love bacon sandwiches for breakfast, I was convinced that we should get one too. So we duly went to the shops and bought ourselves one. Everything was fine until it came to cleaning the thing. Because although the fat runs away into the drip tray beneath, a lot of fat also remains on the hot plates. And on our George Foreman grill, the fat appeared to be welded onto the hot plates. So I rang my father-in-law to find out how I should clean this George Foreman grill. And he told me it was easy. All I needed to do was turn the George Foreman grill on again, then get a bit of hot water, get some soapy water and clean it. And it would, then the fat would come off easily. So I did what I was told, but it didn't go quite according to plan. In fact, on my George Foreman grill, all I managed to do was create a massive explosion and a lot of smoke. And as the water touched the hot plates, I blew all the fuses in our flat. Not a great introduction to the world of George Foreman grills. And although I was told when I rang customer help at George Foreman that our grill was faulty, I have since never been convinced of using that sort of gadget again to cook bacon sandwiches. I prefer the extra washing up using a normal oven grill. Another example I'll give you is about reading. I love going to bookshops and choosing what I want to read next. My usual choice being historical fiction. But I am very choosy when it comes to picking a book and I love a particular author of historical fiction called Bernard Cornwall. And I measure all my reading on whether or not other writers measure up to his quality and his style. But obviously other writers aren't Bernard Cornwall. So although I purchase a book from the bookshop, I only ever read the first few pages and I end up feeling rather disappointed and, I hasten to add, having lots of book bookshelves with lots of books on it. My bank balance usually suffers greatly. I am delighted now, of course, that Amazon Kindle allows you to download books so you can read the first few pages without having to ever buy the book if you don't get on with it. And what about when it comes to relationships with people? When I was a teenager, I became disillusioned with church, as most of us do as teenagers. And to keep my interest at home, I volunteered to, to, to do the church notices every week. I like playing around with computers, and you should have seen the notice sheets in the late 1990s when I was doing the weekly notices. The fonts and the logos were different every week. Anyway, I, dig I, I digress. On Saturday morning, when I was preparing the weekly notices, one Saturday morning, I noticed that we were having a visiting preacher to our church called the Reverend Ermel Kirby. My immediate response 
without knowing anything about the guy at all, was to assume that he was going to be old and he was going to be boring. I even said as much to my mum and dad. My mum just said I was, I was being prejudiced, but I was convinced that I wouldn't like him. Anyway, the day came for the service, and I remember being completely shocked when I met him. Not only was he young, but he was exciting to listen to. And as a result of his preaching, not only then, but subsequently too, I regained my interest in the gospel. And I thank God that I'm here today because of him. Now, my prejudice may easily have led me to dismissing him. And such an introduction and beginning was not helpful to what eventually occurred. So you see, in each example, beginnings or introductions are so important. In the first, I was so traumatised by the experience of using George Foreman grills that I never wanted to use them again. And in my particular reading habits, I am so picky of what I read that I usually end up giving up before ever getting started and getting interested. And in my prejudice, I could have damaged the beginning of a relationship with a new minister. And I'm sure that you can all point to examples of beginnings or introductions in your own life where you've either been so taken with them or simply wanted to walk away. Well, why am I telling you all this in relation to the two readings that we've heard today? Well, it's because those two readings have everything to do with beginnings and understanding our relationship with God. The reading from Genesis chapter 1 is is well known to us. And in verses 1 to 5, we hear how creation comes into being. God, in his three persons, is active in the world. And as the Father brings order out of chaos, so God's word through his Son speaks creation into existence and God's Spirit breathes life into the world as it hovers over the face of the deep waters. From the beginning of creation, we are told that God is alive and active in the world and that he himself is relational. The three persons of the Trinity for this is what the writer of Genesis is telling us, are working together to bring about creation. They complement each other. They defer to each other. And in their humility and creativity, the world is brought into existence. Now, what does this tell us about our relationship with God and with each other? Well, it's very easy, really. Our lives and our relationships are to model God's. Our lives and relationships should be about complementing each other, working together towards bringing order out of chaos in our lives and in our community as we offer the same humility and the same creativity to each other with God as our head and as our guide. And as we do that, as we follow God's example, so we draw closer in relationship to each other and to him. But in order to understand what this means, we have to know who it is that we are in relationship with, which is why beginnings and introductions are so important. And at the beginning of Mark's gospel, the other reading that we had this morning, we get an almost identical description of creation of the new kingdom of God, complementing that of Genesis. Where is it, I hear you say? Mark is a is a very interesting gospel because the pace of the narrative is very fast. There is a sense of urgency about the things the writer wants to convey to his hearers. And the writer of this narrative almost pleads with the hearers of these words to respond to the good news. The writer of Mark's gospel identifies at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus is coming into a world that is chaotic. The people of Israel have fallen away from the correct relationship with God and with each other. And although a messenger has come in the form of John the Baptist to declare that the time has now come for God to make his big entrance in the form of his promised Messiah, 
The world is not ready to receive him. Someone who is greater than John is coming into the world, whom the, sh- uh, whom the world should make ready for, should make ready to receive. But God's people and their lives are not ready. They are so chaotic and sinful that they are anything but ready to receive him. And into this chaos comes Jesus, who goes through the waters of baptism, the waters of chaos and death, and out of them brings new life and new creation. And it's in the baptism of Jesus that we see the mirror image of God's creativity in Genesis. God moves through the waters in the form of Jesus. God speaks as the waters flow over Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And the spirit moves over the face of the waters as it descends and rests on Jesus. Order is brought out of chaos in this moment. And the new kingdom and the new creation and the new relationship with God begin. It's fascinating that both in Genesis and in Mark, immediately following order being brought out of chaos, there is a period of temptation and testing. In Genesis, we remember the period of temptation and testing that Adam and Eve go through in the Garden of Eden as they are encouraged to turn away from their faith and trust in God and to place their faith and trust in the tree of knowledge. They fail in their period of temptation and testing and the relationships that they have with God are damaged forever. Jesus also goes through a period of temptation and testing following his baptism. He goes into the wilderness and spends 40 days there. And as he overcomes the temptation and the testing period, so relationships with God and the new creation found in Jesus start to grow and start to deepen to the extent that new people are then called into relationship with God in the form of disciples and experience for themselves as they spend time in Jesus' company, the joy, the love, the mutual care, the mutual support that God has always wanted for his people and a new relationship and a new kingdom begin. You see, beginnings and introductions are so important in Genesis and Mark because through them we truly see what it means to be a part of God's creation. The beginning of Genesis and Mark shows the complementary nature of the three persons in the Trinity. C.S. Lewis wrote about this as being like a dance, as the persons of the Trinity move in and out of each other, so beautifully as to see the creativity and the joy being in relationship with each other. In Greek, it's known as the perichoresis. It means to dance in circles. C.S. Lewis talks about imagining the beauty of a good dance troupe who understand each other so well that as they create together, so the thing that is presented is bigger than any one of them. This is what God in the three persons of the Trinity is inviting us to be a part of. And this is what the beginnings of Genesis and Mark are showing to us. As we enter into that dance for ourselves, so we see the order being brought out of chaos. And we are transformed by it. We grow closer in love with each other and we grow closer in love with God. And we see the new creation that God desires for the world being born in and among us. So as we think about our relationship with God and with each other, let's recognise how important beginnings and introductions truly are. For through this, we will see who it is we serve and who it is we are in relationship with. Amen.